All right, um, let's go and get started. Let me get this uh, uh, sign-in sheet dated. Okay. I'll get that passed around. So, uh, just a heads up, just so you all are aware, um, I'm thinking there's only going to be two more homework assignments throughout the semester. This is one of them. I mean, other than your, your final, your big uh, concrete report, there's going to be a... Oh, my goodness. Shut up, Java. There's going to be a homework six and a homework seven. Now, I haven't had a chance to post this yet, um, but this isn't going to be due till after uh, Thanksgiving break, and this is going to be a relatively short assignment. Um, the, the long and short of it with this assignment is I want you to understand how to process um, uh, load and deflection data and generate a, a stress strain curve. So we're going to do something uh, similar today in class. We're going to look at, we're actually going to look at a problem in the book, and I think it's going to work out pretty well because the data set's really small and it's something we can manage together quite easily. <coughs> but um, we're going to take this, uh, we're going to take this data and, and process it. We're going to talk a little bit about that. And then today in lab, we've got three big, three big things we're doing today. Let me turn this off. We've got, um, it's 28 days for mix one. So we've got our cylinder tests for mix one. We've got our beam tests for mix one today. And then we also have uh, relevant property, or we also have relevant properties to test with steel. So hopefully today's lecture goes a little shorter because um, uh, I, I want to have as much time in lab uh, as necessary. So everybody okay with this? Okay. So hopefully you all brought your laptops. The only thing you need today is Microsoft Excel. This is a really simple process, but I think you're gonna. Um, you're going to have an idea of how this works. So <coughs> let's, um, let's go ahead and just uh, break out the notes real quick because I want to sort of set the stage. Okay, so <coughs> we talked uh, the last couple times about uh, different available products for steel. And I, and I mean, there's, we talked about bolts, we talked about welds, we talked about reinforcement, we talked about welded wire fabric, strands, um, all nine yards, okay? What I want to talk about now is testing of structural steel and how to post-process those results. Okay, it's pretty simple, but um, I just want to make sure everybody's clear on this. So arguably the most common test that can be done on structural steel, this is true of, uh, of very many materials, is to do a tensile test. Okay, <clears throat> now what we're going to be testing are um, uh, A505 tensile specimens. They look very much like the, uh, the one on the top right. We'll have a few of them today in lab. I believe our, our, what we're going to try and do is test four of them. We're going to test a steel one, an aluminum one, a brass one, and then one made of nylon. So we'll be able to look at different properties of different materials. But all the, um, um, the, all the specimens are the exact same size. I mean, plus or minus tolerances. So you, know, you have the geometry um, aspect is taken out of the equation, and all you're looking at is the material response. That's why attention test is so um, valuable. <coughs> so standard test specimens follow um, given specified dimensions. We're going to be using in lab today A505 tensile specimens. Why are they called 505s? Because their diameter is 0.505 inches. Okay, that's a standard according to uh, ASTM. <coughs> so we'll use this to compute the, uh, the area of the, uh, uh, of the specimen, and then use uh, length G uh, right here, which is just our gauge length, to determine the strain. So change in length over the original length, we'll take our original length to be G, our gauge length, which is 2 inches, and 0.505 is our diameter to get the area. <coughs> once we have our load deflection data, um, once we have that, we can process it into stress strain data, and from there we can get a Young's modulus, we can get a yield stress, we can get a tensile stress, so on and so forth. Now, for steel, um, the yield stress is, for the most part, pretty easy to determine because most times when you test structural steel, there tends to be a little bit of a yield plateau. There's sort of a little hump in the stress strain curve. And that plateau, usually you have, for the most part, perfectly plastic behavior, which means you have increase in strain with no increase in stress 
And so for the most part, you can take that plateau as your yield stress. Some materials don't have a nice, well-defined plateau. It's just a function of the behavior of that material. <coughs> so if you're a designer and you need a value uh, for the purposes of design, a lot of times what you'll use is a yield stress computed by an offset method. So you determine your Young's modulus, the slope of the initial part of the curve, You'll shift that over some specified amount, a lot of times 0.2% or 0.002 strain, a very common value, and wherever that intersects with the curve, we would take this to be, let's say, the yield stress. This might be my yield stress, my tensile stress might be the, uh, the maximum stress on the curve. Everybody okay with that? Don't worry, we're going to do that today, or at least demonstrate how that's done uh, today. Everybody okay with this? <coughs> now, instead of uh, posting a... Uh, um, uh, uh, an Excel file today with data. We were actually diagnosing some calibration issues with the Tinius Olson right up until class. So I decided I'm just going to pull some data out of a problem out of the book because as long as we have representative data, it really doesn't matter. So I'm going to um, use experimental data from a problem in the book. I'm actually going to use problem 326. There's not that many data points, so we can all type them out together. But I'm going to give you load deflection data, which is very typical output for a stress strain for a tensile test. And I want um, to take that data and post-process it and uh, determine what's Young's modulus, what's the yield stress, what's the tensile stress, uh, et cetera. So <coughs> let, me, uh, let, me, oh, sorry. let me break out uh, Microsoft Excel. So I've got a, an Excel sheet here. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out uh, typing out some of this data and then you all can, uh, can follow along. There's not very many data points, so we can do this together. It, it'll be pretty straightforward. Okay, <coughs> so I'm going to start off, I'm going to start a little bit low. I'm going to start down here and we'll say I'm going to have two columns. I'm going to have a load column and this is going to be measured in kips and I'm going to have a deflection column. This is going to be in inches, okay? And let me make those a little wider. Column width, let's make that. Okay. <coughs> we'll do that, something like that. Okay. So when you perform a tensile test, let's just make sure everybody's aware of what we're talking about. We're literally taking a material, some specimen, grabbing it, and just yanking on it. That's literally what we're doing. Okay. So what we're recording are two values. Number one, we're recording what is the load at various intervals. And then number two, what is the deflection? How much have we stretched it at various intervals? So our first point is obviously going to be zero, zero, right? No load, no displacement. <coughs> now I'm going to start typing out the load column first so you all can follow along. So I've got 2.75. 4.07, uh, 7.12, I've got 7.14, I've got 7.34, okay, 7.53, uh, 7.91, 8.28, uh, 8.56, uh, 8.98, uh, 9.15, uh, 9.25, 9.25, 9.34, 7.87. Let me zoom out a little bit. <coughs> Did everybody read that? Maybe what I'll do is uh, you go away. That way we can read it a little better. Everybody with me there? Okay, so that's the load data. Let's record the deflection data. The deflection values are, are to a, a much higher degree of specificity, so there's going to be a few decimal points there. Just bear with me. So this is... Point, point zero 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 nine six point zero zero one four one 
0 .00242, 0 .01691, uh, 0 .00 is that 4196, 0.055847, 0.0511, 0.09577, 0.10878, 1207, 0 0.13372, 14741, 18199. There we go. <coughs> Should I zoom in a little bit more? Is that better? Oh. Actually, yeah, that, that's everything, so that zooms in a little further. <coughs> okay. You, you want me to give you a second, or are you good? No, oh, you're fine. You're fine. Take your time. Everybody good? Okay, all right. So, now I moved that, I put that a little low because I'm going to do some fundamental calcs up here. Okay, so we're going to assume that for the purposes of this example in class that this is a 505 tensile specimen. The problem in the book has a little bit of a, a different diameter, but it really doesn't matter for our purposes. Okay, so we're going to assume that the diameter, the initial diameter of this specimen, so we'll call it D naught, is 0 0.505 inches. Okay? So you tell me, if I have a specimen with a diameter of 0 0.505, how do I determine the area? You're engineers. This is a circle. Pi D squared over 4. There we go. Or pi R squared, however you want to do it. So the area in inches squared is pi. Y'all remember how to do it, uh, pi in Excel? Pi and then left and right parentheses divided by 4 times that squared. <coughs> how are we doing? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now this is a 505 tensile specimen. The initial length we're going to take to be 2 inches. Okay? So far so good? Okay. Now, reason why that's important is because we need to plot stress strain data. Okay? Now, pop quiz. What's goes, what goes on the x-axis? What goes on the y-axis? What goes on the x-axis? Strain. Stress goes on the x-axis. So let's do strain first. Okay? So let's do another column. So we make these a little wider. Make these like 15. Okay. Let's do our first column here. Let's do strain. Now, what are the units for strain? There are no units. It inches per inch, millimeters per millimeters, there are none. So we'll bold that. Okay. So let's do strain. How do we determine strain? Let's just go back to basic mechanics. How do we determine strain? Change in length divided by the original length. Okay. 
So these deflection values, those are the change in length. The specimen starts out at zero, that's its original length, and then it changes, it gets longer. It got longer 0 0.0009 inches, got longer by this much, longer by this much. So these are the change in lengths. So you tell me, how do I do this in Excel? So tell me what to do. You're engineers, you should be Excel gurus by now. So there we go, equals that divided by that. Now what do I do? How do I lock it? F4 or Mac folks. <coughs> you need dollar signs in front of the C and the 4. Windows, F4, Apple, you're on your own. And then, now how do we fill in all these cells? There we go. Double click the little, there we go. The little little anchor on the bottom. You get that, what's that? Y'all didn't do that in computations? I don't know. He was horrible. All right, so what we have in this column is the string, okay? And there are no units, okay? Now, the stress, what do we do with the stress? We take the load and we divide it by the area. So what are the units going to be? Kips over inches squared, or KSI. So we'll do stress, whoop, <coughs> stress and KSI. And I will take the load and divide it by the area locked in. Now, <coughs> I will go ahead and tell you we're dealing with what, like how many data points? 20? I, I, I didn't count it, but what's a quick way of counting it? If you just highlight all of these, you look at the bottom, actually, oh, it, it's right here, you can kind of see it. Yep, so 16 data points, that's not many. When we do our lab test, our lab test is going to have like 1,600 data points. We're going to get just one big Excel file. So this thing is going to be huge. Okay? So I'm not going to be super, super worried that your Excel formatting matches or doesn't. But if I was reporting this data, I would probably take the stress and I'd reduce those decimal points quite a bit. That's a lot of decimal points. Okay? That's a lot. Okay? You can't tell me that that stress computation is accurate, you know, 42.7367.1406 KSI. You're not that good. So that's another thing. Make sure that, and I'm just saying this in general, make sure that when you're reporting results that you're reporting them to a degree of specificity. I got senior, I, this happened so many times in senior design, I can't, care, uh, I can't, you know, I can't count it. Um, students will have a project and it'll be fifty million dollars and they'll say their estimate is fifty million one hundred forty eight thousand nine hundred forty six dollars and twenty seven cents. You're not that good. You, you're not that good. So. <coughs> All right. Let me bring this, this, this back up. Okay. So you should have an outline that looks something about like this or, or a layout. Um, a quick way of doing a stress strain curve plot is literally highlight, highlight this. Okay, go to insert. Which what kind of plot are we going to insert? Let's see if y'all remember. Well, it's not a point. What I'm getting at is a scatter plot. We're going to a scatter plot and then do like straight lines. <coughs> Man, <coughs> it looks well. <laughs> Golly gosh. Now, a couple things. If you send me this, I'm about just going to mark it wrong. Okay? This is, it says chart title. <laughs> no, I don't. Engineering requires specificity. So, a couple things. First thing I'm going to do, let me move this over a little bit. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do, there's a little plus sign whenever you highlight the chart. Go in, add some axis titles. Right off the bat. 
This is strain. This is stress. What is that enough? No. What is what do I do? Units. You Apple folks, you're gonna have to figure it out. Stress in KSI. Tensile test results. And we'll say this is grade 36 steel. Now that has a little bit more specificity associated with it. Is the clicking popping up on this? It was funny, there was a, um, a clip I saw of, a, it was a really funny gadget. It was, uh, you plug it into your uh, uh, USB port and it was an enter key, just an enter key, but it was about this big and it was, it was really, it was padded. So you would type a line, enter, type a line, <laughs> enter. <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Okay. All right. A couple things, all right. Let's, let's take a look at this curve and let's see if we can delineate some useful data, okay? So number one, okay, who remembers how we define the tensile stress, F sub U? I told you, but now I'm quizzing you. What is the tensile stress? Now my steel folks, they, they better know this. No. No, that's the yield stress. I'm talking about, actually, there's F sub Y and there's F sub U. What is F sub U? The absolute maximum stress we reach. Absolute maximum. What is that? Well, why don't I just look here? So, <coughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to say my F sub U, so <laughs> if we look up here, I'm going to put some values here. So, E in KSI, we're going to go FY in KSI. We're going to go FU in KSI. Okay. Y'all sure you want to take steel design? Like, we're going to see that value like every day. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. So I'm going to take this as the maximum of that column, and so I'm going to say that's about 47.1 KSI. Do y'all see how I did that, how I squunched the decimals up a little bit? Squunched the decimals? Well, I was a little distracted by, by Siri. You Apple folks. Oh, okay. We're talking about these buttons right there on the number tab. So if you look, there's some, there's the dollar. This will turn it into a currency. This will turn it into a percentage. And then there's, bless you, then there's increase decimal and decrease decimal. So there's expand and then there's squunching. Those are technical terms. <laughs> you got to have fun with this job. Okay. <coughs> All right. So far, so good? Okay. All right. Now, let's talk about Young's modulus. Okay? Young's modulus. All right? How do I determine Young's modulus? First of all, what is Young's modulus? What is Young's modulus? Just tell, not, not, none of the calcs, just tell me what it is. What is E? The slope of the linear region. All right. Now, how would I calculate that in the linear regions? Tell me how we do that. How do you calculate slope of a line? Change in y over change in x. Right. Now, if I had to guess based on this graph, I think I've got three points here. Let's see. Let's do this. Let's go and let's change this curve, this graph. So, watch what I'm going to do here. 
Okay, I'm going to go to design. I'm going to go to change chart type. And I'm going to add, I'm going to do markers. Straight lines and markers. Design, and then it's right here. I did straight lines and markers. The reason why is because I wanted to see the points. I wanted to see the points. Right. Oh. Does everybody have a plot now that looks something about like this, where you can actually see the data points? Raise your hand if you don't. I mean, that's what we're here for. We've got plenty of time. What's that? You win those people. Yeah. Okay. What? What's that? Whoa. What happened? <laughs> We're, settle down. Settle down. Settle down. Okay. What do we got? Um. It is. It's, uh, there's a zero. It's point zero nine five seven seven. Who else doesn't have the marker showing up? <laughs> what? Whoa. You need to check through your data points. Cause oh, whoa, 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 hold on. Go to select data. You got two series. You're doing the wrong one. That's the problem. It, watch this. Where's the delete button? It's, okay. You're inserting the wrong chart. You got to insert, and you insert a scatter. Does anybody else need help? Yeah, I mean, don't don't be shy. If you're, I want to make sure you can do this. Okay. The the plots that you get on your uh, homework and on uh, with the lab are just going to have that many more data points. So you, if you can't do this, I mean, if you got problems, please. Everybody good? <coughs> All right. Where were we? Young's modulus, right? So what is Young's modulus again? It's the slope in the linear region, right? Okay, so how do we do that? We take change in y over change in x. Okay, so this is what I would do. Okay, so uh, let me do this. How many data points do we have in the linear region? Well, four, but this one's zero. I'm saying we. I mean, if I this one, I'm going to take zero divided by zero, and it's not going to give me anything, right? Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say there's really three ways I could do this. I could take this stress divided by this strain, this stress divided by this strain, this stress divided by this strain. Let, let's see what happens. Let's see what values we get. So let me move this over a little bit. So let's over here on the side, let's take these first three data points and let's say stress divided by strain, stress divided by strain. I can copy that down. <coughs> stress divided by strain. Okay. What is the Young's modulus for steel typically? 29,000 KSI. I want that number burned into your memory before you get out of here. Your degree at Marshall. 29,000 what? There we go. There we go. Now, are these numbers making sense? I mean, this is test data, so it's going to be a little, little awful. You know, but for the most part, this makes sense. Typically, what I would do is I'd probably take the one off of the largest data point, the highest one up, but really you, get, you just have to use your best judgment. I'll, I'll say this. This is a pretty easy one because the data points, the, the Young's moduli are so close together. In some testing scenarios, it might not be. Okay? And I'm going to show you real quick a way that you can check that. So I'm going to take this last one. I'm going to take this one. So I'm going to say that E equals this, okay? 
I'm going to say that. <coughs> Let me center this up. Okay, everybody with me on this? All right. <coughs> now, let's say you just pick a value and you go, I am just not sure if this is right. Okay? Let me show you something. I want everybody to follow along with me. Okay? I'm going to set up another table right over here. So I'm going to set up a stress strain table right here. Okay? Actually, let me move this over and move that about like that. <coughs> okay. I'm going to set up another table. This is what I'm going to do. My, all the column widths? Okay, that's a good question. Watch this. Okay, so highlight whatever columns you want to stretch. And do you see how I did that? I like click the D and the E. Right click. Column width. And so I went with like 15. My resolution on this computer is a little different probably than yours. This computer's resolution is a little strange in general because it's meant for display in classrooms. So usually the text and whatnot's a little different. Are we okay with this? <coughs> well, you got a text now. I shouldn't have. <laughs> what? That's yeah. You can, that doesn't change it, though. <coughs> okay. Everybody with me so far? Well, I, I need everybody. Yes. Engineers require specificity, so. I've got the exact same numbers, the exact same calculation, but I'm off by one decimal place. You're dividing by the area, not the length. Huh? Strain is change in length oh. divided by the original length, not. <coughs> How do you walk the graph into that cell? What? I don't know what you're talking about. What? See how it's all. I think it just happened to the graph like this over here. So basically, so it's locked to the cell. Yeah, I just cut the graph out and pasted it right there. So. Now, this is a great question. Watch this. Let me show you something. Watch this. I'm going to go to design, change chart type. You probably picked that smooth lines and markers. And what Excel is trying to do is come up with some smooth pattern that fits all these data points. Don't do that. No, ser seriously, because it, it, you're, it's leading to interpretations that aren't real. Okay? So always go with straight lines. So that's a good question. Everybody good so far? Okay. Is everybody with me so far? Are there any other things I need to correct or, you know, work through? Okay. Watch this. So what were we doing? Let's get back on track. We're trying to check and see if this is the correct value. So watch this. Okay. I'm going to start off. I'm going to plot a stress strain curve. And all I'm going to do is two values. My first values are zeros. <coughs> okay. All right. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, and I think it's usually easier to pick a, uh, 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 let's go ahead and pick a stress. So let's pick something like, I don't know, 45. Okay. And then to get the strain, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this stress and I'm going to divide it by that. So you should get a strain that looks something about like this. 
divided by e. What's that? No, I'm. I said why. I know. Like even like e y. No, I'm like, why are you doing? Why are you divided by e? So was it a joke? Like I. Yeah, that was a joke. I don't. Yeah. Okay. Here's the reason that I'm doing that. Okay. Okay. Bear with me. Listen to the listen. Follow along. Okay. All right. Hold on. Is this? Do you remember that? Yeah. Are you good? Yeah. I'm good. Okay. I All right. Got All right. Do you all remember that? This is the stress strain curve in the linear region. What I'm doing is I'm saying, assuming a linear relationship, given a certain value of stress, what would be my corresponding strain value? And it would be the stress divided by Young's modulus. Is everybody with me on that? There's a reason why I'm doing this. Just bear with me, okay? So I'm going to erase all this. Okay, this is what I'm doing. Watch this. Watch. Okay, let's go back to my curve. Okay, I'm going to go to design, and I'm going to go to select data. Okay, select data. All right, and you should get a window that pops up, looks something about like this. Okay, is everybody with me? Yes. I'm making that up. You'll see why. You'll see why. Bear with me. Okay. Everybody pay attention? Okay. I'm going to add another data series. All right. Hold, hold on. Pay, pay attention. All right. I'm going to plot X values from the strains and Y values from the stresses. And hit OK. And hit OK. So look what I've got. Does, does everybody have a plot that looks something like this now? <clears throat> I'm showing you this for a very specific reason. Okay, you tell me, do you think that 29,378 is an accurate representation of Young's modulus for this data, yes or no? I'm going to say yes. Why are we saying that? Because if I plot a straight line with that slope, that pretty much follows that linear range. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? That's why we did that. So why did I pick 45? It didn't matter. I just wanted something with magnitude so I could see what was going on. Any questions? Everybody okay with this? Now, I'm going to show you something else too. Alright? I'm going to take this graph and I'm going to move it down because I want one more stress strain curve. Okay? So it's all said and done, we're going to plot three stress strain curves. Okay? <coughs> Alright. Do you remember me mentioning the offset? The 0.2% offset or something like that? Let me explain how you do that. It's that, it's, it's, this is incredibly simple, okay? Um, over here, maybe like over here, let me box this. Um, I'm going to type in a desired offset, okay? And let's go ahead and go with 0.2%. So 0.2, and you can actually do 0.2%, and it will it will know how to compute that accordingly. <coughs> so that value is 0.2% or if I change my number formatting to a number, it's 0 0.002. So if I extend that out, it's 0 0.002. Make sense? Okay. Now watch this. Or everybody pay attention. Okay, you, you get a kick out of this. See this chart up here? This is what I'm going to do. The stress values, 
I'm going to get from right here. So literally just equals that, equals that. So 0 and 45. The strain values, what I'm going to do with the strain values is that to get these strain values, I'm going to take these, I'm going to add that. So equals this plus that. And if you want to lock it in, you can lock it and do that. <coughs> Any questions? Hey, you can. It doesn't matter. Um, I, let's go ahead and do that. We can highlight that and just go to general. It doesn't matter, and I think you're going to see why here in a second. Any questions so far? These just equal that to get these, that plus my offset. Now, I want you to do one more graph, one more plot. So we'll click my chart, design, select data, and let's add another data series. So add, here's my x values, here's my y values. <coughs> Does everybody see that? Bless you. That's a 0.2% offset. Now watch this. The way I've got this set up, it's all linked to that 0.2% offset. What if I'm feeling crazy and said, let's make that a 2% offset? It updates accordingly. So 0.2% offset, there we go. What is your uh, formula is K9? K9. Yeah. I'm literally just adding, taking the strain and adding that offset. Okay. So I locked the offset on that in the previous one. <laughs> Any questions? This is important, okay, and here's why. For this curve, I think it's pretty easy to just take one look at the curve and say the yield stress is probably like 35 KSI. But if you have a stress strain curve that's nonlinear, that has a very, you know, pump shape to it, the idea is, okay, we'll determine our initial elastic modulus, offset it, and then wherever that intersects the curve, that's my yield stress. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, um, let me take my curve. I'm going to make it really big. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> now, if I zoom in, we can probably determine that with some specificity. Can I show you something real quick? Watch this. All right, I want you all to do something. I want you to go to your curve, and I want you to click your axis, and right-click and hit Format Axis. And you should have a menu pops up over here on the right. It looks something about like this. Does everybody have that? Okay. <coughs> Format Axis. Okay. Now look at what we have here. I want you all to pay attention to this. Okay. Look at what we have. We have minimum and maximum, where it says 0 and 50. Okay, so 0 and 50 says the axis goes from 0 to 50. Okay, we have major unit lines at 5, so that's why it says 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 50, or 25, 30, so on and so forth. But see where it says minor and it says 1? Let me show you something. Okay. See that little plus next to the chart? Okay, I'm going to hit chart elements. I'm going to go to grid lines. And see how it says primary major horizontal, primary major vertical? Do minor horizontal. Look what happens. Y'all see it? Now, when I look at that, that offset, I can say, well, it's somewhere between 35 and 36 KSI. Does everybody see that? 
So I could, I'll probably say something on the order of like 35.6 KSI. Make sense? So that, that, that would mean for this material, I have a yield stress. We'll take our yield stress to be, uh, let me move this down. Our yield stress to be 35.6 KSI. Okay. Click my chart. Do you all have this over here on the side of the chart, a little plus symbol where it says chart elements? Right here. Look, look. How about this? Try that. See it? I'm, I'm going to call it 35.6, something about like that. What do you think? <coughs> that would be your yield stress. That would be your FY. What do you think? Okay, first thing I did is I just literally dragged it like that. You know, get it, get the graph larger, and if you want, like I'm using a mouse, I'm using my wheel, but if, yeah, you can just drag over here on the bottom. So I'm going to call that to be about 35.6. I don't think it's quite 0.5. I think it's a little higher. Uh, I think it's about, no. We're talking, okay, you go with 35.5. I mean, if you want your whole bridge to fail, I mean, go ahead. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <coughs> All right, how are we feeling about this? Is this simple, complicated? Any questions? This? The only, the only thing you need to add is this, okay? So, first off, a couple things, all right? We're, we're not quite done for turning it in. For turning it in, I would do two things. Number one, I would re-change my chart size back to a normal size. So if you, go to, if you click your chart and you look at your tabs where it says format, like I can go back to make it a chart that's, you know, three inches tall and five inches wide to get it back to like a, you know, reasonable size. And... The only other thing I would do is, what do you think's missing from this chart? You tell me. I got three different curves on here. A legend. There we go. So, what I would do is go to add chart element and add a legend. You can put it wherever you want. I'm probably going to put mine on the bottom. <coughs> now, it's going to say series one, series two, and series three. What you're going to need to do is you're going to need to go to your chart and you're going to need to go to select data, and you're going to need to go to each one of these series and give them a name. So if I go to series one, I might call this stress strain curve and hit OK. And then series two, I might call this um, elastic modulus. And then series three, I might call that offset or something like that offset or 0.2 percent offset actually that'd be better <coughs> so now I've got something that's a little reasonable everybody with me on this No, this is a great question. This is a great question. We're going to talk a little bit more about some formatting here in a second. I'm going to, I'm going to address that here in a second. Though. Is, is something wrong? <laughs> Can you save it? Uh, 
Um, got some holy water. <laughs> Say what? Our, our question was, how do you edit the labels in your legend? Okay, so once you've got the chart selected, go to the top to the ribbon, go to the design tab, hit select data. Once you select the data, you can edit each one of those series, and you can change the name of the series. By changing the name of the series, that will automatically update what's in the legend tab. Everybody good? We got a couple more things we need to do. Well, go ahead. What's that? What do you mean? Well, that's when we zoomed in and and looked, and we said it's about thirty-five point six. Everybody with me? Okay. A couple other things that we need to do. Um, uh, Mr. Skaggs brought up a really good point. If you print this off in black and white, it, it, you're not going to be able to easily tell the difference from one curve to another. So here's what I would do. Okay, what you can do, you can do this one of two ways. Okay, if you go to the Format tab, see where it says Chart Area up top. Everybody see that on the top left where it says Chart Area? It says chart area because that's what I have selected. I can drop that down and say stress strain curve. And now I can format the stress strain curve ac accordingly. I can change the line, change the markers, change whatever. What I'm actually going to do is this. I'm going to take the markers off. Okay. So I'm going to go to marker and say no markers because I really don't think you need it for the stress strain curve. Especially with what you all do in lab, there's going to be thousands of data points. They're, those little markers ain't going to tell you anything, so I just take them off. <coughs> you all see that? So I went to stress strain curve, format selection, and then over here you can see line, marker, so on and so forth. You all see that? Everybody good? I went to, you can get a line or marker. I went to marker and went to marker options and turned the marker off. You can go to automatic and that'll leave them on or none. I went none. In fact, I'm going to turn the markers off for all of them. <coughs> Is everybody good? Now, now watch with me. I want to show you something. Okay. I'm going to go to elastic modulus. Okay. I'm going to turn the markers off, but I want you to pay attention. We'll turn the markers off, but I'm going to go to line, and instead of uh, uh, the way it's got it plotted, I'm going to go to dash type, and I'm going to make that like a dashed line. Do you see that? You see what I did? So I went to dash type, and I made that a dashed line. So now, when I hit print, if it's in black and white, you can tell the difference. And, and honestly, whenever you're representing data, you really need to take this stuff into account. I mean, you, you need to make sure that it's representative. I mean, what if you've got somebody reviewing your data that's colorblind? That's a very real thing. And if you're rep using colors to identify your data series and they can't differentiate that, that's, that's serious. So make sure that you can uh, incorporate that. Um, I'm going to go to 0.2% offset. I'm going to make, I'm going to turn my marker off. And let's not use a dashed line. Let's use a dotted line. Something different. <coughs> Any questions? Yeah, yeah. Y'all think you can replicate this on the homework and on the exams? Oh, no, that's right, you can't. Let me ask you this. 
do you think you can interpret a stress strain curve on the exam? You're here on your own then. Can we zoom in? Oh. Oh. I might give you all some data and have you do some math on it. I'm not going to make you do all these repetitive calcs, but. Yes. Next exam is the final. Yes. Yes. Any questions? <coughs> okay, I would like to very briefly mention a couple other laboratory tests that we deal with in steel. Um, just to sort of round out the, the closure of the topic. So what we're talking about right now and up until this point has been tension testing. All right, everybody come on, pay attention, we'll get back in here. All right, so tension testing is taking an element and literally yanking on it, okay? Torsion testing is doing the very same thing but twisting it until failure, okay? Now, if Young's modulus or the elastic modulus gives you the relationship in tension, the shear modulus gives you the relationship in twisting, you know, the relationship between the applied stress and the resulting rotation, okay? And that's what G is. It's the shear modulus. Now, that test is not as common for a very specific reason. If you have Young's modulus and you have the Poisson's ratio, you can compute that. In deformable, y'all should have derived that. So, yes. <coughs> this was 326. The only thing that's different is I changed the area up to be 0.505. The area, the area in the book is 0.5, but it doesn't. All right, everybody good? Okay, so you should, uh, this test isn't as necessary because if you have Poisson's ratio and you have E, you have the Young's modulus, you can compute this. I mean, we do uh, perform this test. Um, we actually have a, a torsion tester in the new building, or in this building uh, on the first floor, but we won't really need to use it. Um, <coughs> in the world of bridge engineering, one of the uh, uh, very important characteristics of a, um, uh, uh, of a particular bridge steel is how much energy is required to fracture that steel. So the way that we uh, measure that uh, is to perform what's called a Charpy test, a Charpy V-notch test. We take a little piece of steel, it's about, about yay big, about like that, and it's got a little notch cut in, a little V-notch, hence Charpy V-notch testing. Okay? And the idea is we take that specimen and we set it in this particular testing apparatus and we, we do this at, at various temperatures as well. So we'll have one at room temperature, one really hot, one really cold, uh, et cetera. And the idea is we take this hammer, we bring it up to a particular height, and we let it go, and then that swings. Okay? We measure the amount of energy that is required to fracture that, uh, that material. And the idea is that's really important uh, in, in bridge deals, especially in considerations where there are fatigue. That's a really uh, important characterization. We don't need to do that uh, for the purposes of this class. I just want you to be aware of Charpy testing if at the very least you enter the bridge industry when you get out of here. You might hear about Charpy testing, like what's a Charpy test? That's a Charpy test, so, so that you're aware of that. Um, <coughs> the only other, there's a couple other tests that are kind of important. Bend testing is kind of important. Um, this is, I would say, most important um, in regards to rebar. So you see here I've got some uh, some, you know, regular rectangular specimens. But really, in civil engineering, um, I would argue the number one thing we are bending the most into a permanent shape is rebar, okay? So, for instance, if you've got a, a reinforced concrete beam, you know, you'll have some steel on the bottom, let's say resisting the tension in the beam, but you'll have a series of stirrups along the beam to hold that cage together. And those stirrups tend to be bent. And if you don't bend it the appropriate way or at the appropriate radius, I mean, you can crack your rebar. You'd be surprised how, how easy it can be. So this is just a test to ensure that you're meeting appropriate bend requirements uh, and so on and so forth. <coughs> this is getting a little bit outside of, of our realm in civil engineering. This is a Rockwell hardness test. This is more about measuring the hardness of the surface of a given material. So this would be more important on, like, if we were doing uh, uh, investigation of tool steel. Like you need, you know, tool steel, we're really interested in the hardness of the surface, 
but we're not really worried about that in buildings or bridges. Uh, so anything that has to have a very high surface characteristic, uh, we would need to perform a Rockwell hardness test. Um, the only other thing I think I have here in my, uh, in my notes on steel is the effects of corrosion, okay? Corrosion is bad, okay? And um, unfortunately, in, in a lot of cases, it, it, it's, it's tough to avoid. It costs our country a lot of money each year uh, in, in some way, shape, or form. We use steel and metals to build our infrastructure. And when they corrode, they don't perform the, per, uh, the function that we intend them to, okay? So that, that costs us a lot of money. And so corrosion protection is, is really important. I would argue in regards to bridge maintenance, it's one of the biggest headaches and biggest um, issues that maintenance engineers face, period, is corrosion in some way, shape, or form, okay? For corrosion to occur, you got to have four things. <coughs> you got to have an anode and a cathode for the, uh, the electricity to flow that will, that will cause the, uh, the uh, corrosion. You're going to need a conductor, and you're also going to need an electrolyte. The rebar or the, the steel uh, tends to provide the top three. I mean, this, you've got an anode and a cathode and a conductor present in the steel, but you need an electrolyte for corrosion to occur. And one of the things kind of interesting, pure water, it, it doesn't really do very well uh, in performing as an electrolyte. Like if you have steel and it's just pure water, that's not really a recipe for, for corrosion. But if you've got salt in that water, if there's acid rain going on, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, uh, uh, environmental uh, effects on, on, on our infrastructure. Usually it's not just water, especially uh, around here. Um, so for instance, it's the winter, um, what do we put on our bridge decks in the winter? We put road salts, right? Those, those, those chlorides penetrate, they penetrate into the deck, they hit the rebar, bam. What happens to metal when it rusts? It expands. So what do you think happens to a bridge deck if you've got rebar cast inside it and that rebar is beginning to corrode? It expands and it it cracks. So there begins issues of maintenance in our, um, <coughs> in our industry. Honestly, uh, nowadays there's really sort of two ways that we prevent corrosion, at least in, um, at least in, in bridges and in, in the bridge industry. Um, we used to paint bridges, okay? If you're working on a project, a new project, new bridge, and somebody says they want to paint that bridge. You tell them to go like this. Brand new? Let me ask you this. Did you paint the entire bridge or just like connections? It's because there's a perception that, that there's additional potential of seepage into the bolt holes in between the plates and so on and so forth. So the idea is that the plates offer you a little bit of extra protection. Nowadays, painting, uh, in my expert opinion, is not an appropriate way to provide corrosion protection because of the money involved. What do you have to do to a bridge that's been painted after 10 years? You gotta paint it again. Then you gotta paint it again. Then you gotta paint it again. You ever heard the story about the crew that paints the Golden Gate Bridge? They start at one end, they paint all the way to the other end, and by the time they get to the other end, the paint on the other end is as deteriorated to the point that they have to start all over. So they are always painting the Golden Gate Bridge. Always. Forever. Now that's cool, and that's an interesting structure, but, but I don't think that's an appropriate use of our resources for the entire bridge in inventory in the U.S. If you've got a steel bridge, I would do one of two things, okay? One of them is to use a type of steel called weathering steel. How many have heard of weathering steel? Okay. If you haven't, you've probably seen it. If you ever see a new bridge going up and it's got the steel has kind of like a maroon color, uh, a maroon brownish color, like, kind of like your shirt, but like a little 
little little browner almost. Have you, have you ever seen steel girders kind of look like that? Okay, that's that girder utilizes what's called weathering steel. They change the uh, the chemistry of the uh, of the alloy a little bit so that under the presence of oxygen, it actually forms a it's it's like a rust patina. That layer of corrosion actually prevents additional corrosion from entering into the girder. It's a little bit pricier, but maintenance-wise, it's super easy. So it's like you're paying a little bit more dollars you know, per pound at the beginning, but you're saving so much headache in the long run. That's one way of, of uh, preventing corrosion. Another way of preventing corrosion is to galvanize a girder. Okay. So actually hot dip galvanizing, actually taking the girder and dipping it into a large zinc bath and, you know, generating galvanizing. You all probably seen galvanized steel. It's got that rough gray look to it. Okay. You will get enough mils of zinc on that surface. You will never have corrosion issues. I mean, galvanizing, in my opinion, is, is also one of the other big way to go, big ways to go. So new bridges. What do you do to new bridges? What do you not do to new bridges? Don't paint them. Don't paint them. Can you galvanize an existing bridge? That's a good question. Um, I'll say this. Um, I, I, I was, uh, um, there's a case study on that very question not too long ago, and what you can do is you can tear out pieces of that bridge, strip them, galvanize them, and reinstall them. You can do that. But in the galvanizing process, don't you uh, have like a positive or negative for electrons that are affected? <coughs> well, okay, so, so the galvanizing process is a, it's a multi-step process, and a lot, the, before you even dip, the first thing that you have to do is you have to, you know, wash the steel, you have to pickle it, you have to remove all of that existing surface corrosion off of it. So the existing surface corrosion is gone. Once that's done, it's literally just dipping it into a molten bath of zinc and it bonds onto the, uh, it bonds onto the specimen. So. Uh, you, you might be able to, but, but the actual you know, process, the, the actual automated process of pickling and all that, that's sort of factory setting. So, One thing that was kind of interesting, and then I'll, I'll let us go because we got lab here in a little bit, but I actually went to a galvanizing plant in, uh, in Cleveland not too long ago. We were uh, uh, testing the effects of galvanizing on uh, some of my PhD research, and we went out to this place in Cleveland, and it was cold. When I say cold, it was cold, okay? But here, here's the interesting part about it. Okay, so if you've ever been to a galvanizing plant, there are these really long sort of open warehouse type spaces. Okay, you've got a big pool of molten zinc in the middle of the room, and the ceiling's probably 50, 60 feet high. Now, this place is for the most part exposed to the elements. I mean, there's walls on the outside, but it's, it's not like there's much insulation. It's cold in there. The cool part was, so... They dipped. They were dipping the. Um, uh, they were dipping the, the elements into the zinc bath, and that generated a lot of steam. Okay, so that steam rose to the ceiling. It was so cold that it turned into snow, and it was snowing inside the building. That was cool. <laughs> that was just a cool thing to see because there was like clouds. Like right there. It was kind of cool. I thought that was nifty. So I didn't think it was too nifty because I was really cold. So, all right, let's do this. Um, I usually say let's get together in 15 minutes. Let's actually get together at two o'clock. I got some data sheets to print off and whatnot, and I need to have some time to do that. So let's just get together at two o'clock. All right. <coughs> so it's 20 minutes instead of 15.